welcome to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. Today, we welcome Marcus Kramer, author of The Guiding Purpose Strategy and Navigational Code for Brand Growth. I will call Marcus now my cousin. Oh, uh, Marcus, how are you? Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Or well, virtual cousin, so to speak. Nice to be with you. <laughs> it's good to have family now in Zurich, Switzerland, right? That's where you're at? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, we're thrilled to have you here. What, well, give us a little bit about your professional background. Right. So the name, you know, I work in the space of helping businesses, generally not only. Some are NGOs, some are governments in strategic brand management. And what that means is generally honing positioning, sharpening messaging, and very often it branches into reputational work as well. It's what I do for larger companies, larger organizations, but also for medium-sized companies. I also teach at the CAS Business School, City University in London in strategic brand management, but I do this mostly when I have the time for it out of a passion. It's not my full-time profession, but I hugely enjoy it. And other than that, yeah, I love to think, breathe, brand in every way I can. Written this book, The Guiding Purpose Strategy, we're going to talk about it. Other than that, uh, if you wonder where I'm from, I'm Swiss in Zurich. My accent is, uh, is not from Ireland or anywhere else, nor Dutch. I'm Swiss. Uh, we've got, well, I and my wife, we have three kids, three teenagers, lots of gray hair for me. But generally and enjoying lots of life. Gray hair for me too. So, so things, are, things are generally good despite this crazy 2020 and despite this crazy uh, year that we're all uh, living through. So uh, tell us, why did you write this particular book? Well, this book really came about probably about 15 years, probably closer to 20 years in working for brands generally, or working on brand and brand strategy and with executives and so forth. And at some point I thought, I need to start putting things down because I think we are really facing fundamental shifts in how competitive differentiation works in particular. So I really think there's a paradigm shift happening and it's probably a good time to start jotting stuff down. And so over a period of a couple of years, this book came about. Well, I have to say, I really enjoyed this book. And, and it's like one of those books that you actually should be reading twice because there's so much uh, information, especially a lot of the research that you've done uh, with this book. Thank so you. it's really, really well done. What's the, what is the concept behind the guiding purpose strategy? So the fundamental premise here is that over, let's say the last, well, I would say ever, ever since we've become marketeers and you know, business builders and what have you, last hundred years or so, or even more, the really fundamental principle here is that, as I said, paradigms are shifting from no longer just to differentiate on a product and on a price. And so USPs are changing. And therefore, the whole idea of leadership, like, you know, why, why should I, I want, I want to become a leader and I want to become a leader in my category, a leader of my business, leader of my product, that move to, it's not enough. We need to understand the strategy behind this. And if you have people working for you, you're a good leader, they will want to know where you go. Strategy entered the field, competition entered the field and competitive differentiation entered the field. And we are just at this point of, um, of inversion where we see it's no longer good enough either. People don't know or don't just want to know what you do and how you do it, but why you do what you do. And so this is intrinsically linked to purpose, intrinsically linked to culture, and intrinsically linked to creating differentiation, not just through a product or a service, but through the cultures you build. And so that is very often expressed through the brand that you represent. And so this is really the fundamental principle is this idea of having a, a deeper reason why you exist embedded in your business, not just in your logo or your beautiful brochures, but really in your value system. And um, it's new. I think it's going to stick around for at least the next 10 to 20 years. We're only just at the start. It started about 10 years ago, I would say, perhaps a bit more. But I see it, um, no, I see it at least as the next two or three decades. So this is at the heart or the core. Yeah, right? I, I, I agree that it's not about your brochures and your logo uh, because you become a brand by people knowing this is what you do and you become well known for it. How has COVID affected this? 
Well, COVID affected this in a, in a sense um, as an accelerator, I would say, just like digital. Uh, the fundamental questioning of why we do what we do has probably been boosted um, uh, by this whole crisis of asking some deeper questions, some larger questions on a more uh, tactical or a business level. It's interesting to see that, you know, if you can't do what you did before or the way you did it before, perhaps it's time to rethink. And so I see quite a few people, but also companies to fundamentally rethink or to pivot, so to, so to, so to speak. And I think, if uh, if anything, it's gained in uh, in, in relevancy. Uh, what's your definition of brand? My definition of brand, my definition of brand is well, I'll give you um, a, um, a slightly short version and a slightly longer version. But the definition of brand, as the word implies, brand comes from the very word branding rot. So this was really about a marking in the very early days um, assets. Well. Cows, for example, cowboys used an iron rod to brand their whole herds. So brand is a really in its simple sense, an identification of an asset. And what this means is a product, a business, a service, you name it, has an identity, so to speak, with a logo. I think what's changed uh, in recent years, and I think in the recent probably 30 to 50 years, is that we start to attach promises to such an identity. And it's no longer just a logo, but it's a promise. And that brings a whole raft of different things with it. So for me, it is an, an identification of asset. It's an identification of some sort associated and attached with a larger promise mm -hmm. of value generally towards an audience. Is it uh, to become a brand because you have a reputation for something or can you just create a brand um, before even selling anything? Okay, so kind of a chicken and egg question, I think. But I think both work, um, but both are really different. If we go back in time, it used to be that you are really building brands based on reputation. Um, let's find, for example, if you think about Louis Vuitton, right? Louis Vuitton, powerful brand. I hope most of you guys here on the call will know who they of are. And Louis Vuitton, right? Luxury brand and so forth. But Louis Vuitton was an entrepreneur and he didn't build a brand. He never thought about building a brand. He just made a really good product. And his whole invention was around, not about building a luxury conglomerate, but his whole invention was to build travel trunks of superior quality. And these travel trunks had one super benefit. They were not concave, because if you can imagine 150 years ago, people go travel, they take their suitcases, they put them on big boats, a storm comes up and you had concave travel cases. So the water could repel off your suitcases. His invention was let's make them flat because if we make them flat, we can stack travel trunks on top of each other. Very rational thought, very good entrepreneur, very good quality. And he built a reputation for himself so good or so well that even the king you know, pulled him in to say, can you create my travel gear? Mm -hmm. He didn't build a brand. He became a brand. He became a brand because of his reputation. Many luxury brands, by the way, um, work like this. And uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of depth to that. But going back to your question, what, which way does it work? If you take a brand of today, let's take Tesla, for example, right? So Tesla didn't build a brand around reputation. Tesla built a brand around the vision and it's crazy. People just go crazy on Tesla. It's a strategy of hope that this will return some money in the future, but it's built on a dream, on an aspiration, and it's a deliberate intent to create the brand with a value proposition that will follow. Some of it already does, but hopefully a lot more to fulfill the promise this brand makes. It's very, it's very different. It's a very different approach to building a brand. Both work. I think, you know, because of who Elon Musk is, you know, it's an entrepreneur. I think if GM right. did exactly the same thing, called it Tesla, everything, it wouldn't have done anything. It would look just like another brand in their, in their garage. But because mm -hmm. it was Elon Musk and he's kind of the Howard Hughes of his era, mm -hmm. that's why people uh, got so excited because they're only selling a fraction of the cars that GM sells, but they he could buy GM for pocket change for the size of their valuation. Very true. And, you know, if you look at Apple, you know, Jeff Bezos, Amazon and so forth, or Steve Jobs, who is no longer with us, of course, but it's similar. So you have entrepreneurial personalities that, of course, have a reputation and, of course, as part of that, shape the brand as well. 
And so you can do both. You can build a brand based on reputation. I think that's really a very solid, very thorough approach. And it's a much healthier approach to do it that way. Or you can create the brand from inside out. Um, the models I work with with my clients generally are here to build brands from the inside out, either new or adjust or refocus them based on a system, based on a framework, based on a ambition, based on a vision, based on objectives, and then create value and start filling it uh, with value from within. So both, I think both work. You write about a meaningful brand drives higher profits. Uh, what is the formula and do you have some examples? A magic wand, all right, to do both, profit and do good for the planet. Mm -hmm. um, well, example, I mean, I think firstly, we have to really hold one thought and it's as that meaningfulness is really, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? So it's subjective. What is meaningful to you might not be meaningful to me. When we talk about this in brand speak or in business speak, we automatically associate meaningfulness with doing good for, sus for society, doing good for the planet, uh, being sustainable and so forth. But that doesn't necessarily mean uh, the same to everybody, meaningfulness. So if you ask about meaningful brand in the sense of doing good, then I would say look at Patagonia, very, very famous brand, uh, you know, consistently over decades, um, doing really well, a lot better than their peers. And you know, I don't know how much they're valued, but certainly well over a trillion, returning profits all the time and really doing genuinely value-based uh, stuff, value-based work. Now, what is the magic wand or you know, what, what do you need to, to do both? I think there are two things really critical. One is culture, value-based culture. You can't do meaningfulness in the sense of doing good without having uh, a culture that supports based on a value system to do the right thing in the first place. However, um, you need also profit. Right? You need profit and you need margins that are superior to actually do it. It's easy to say, it's hard to do. We, know, we all know competitive pressures. We all know how difficult it is to, to kind of you know, return a profit out there. If your margins are weaver thin, how do you want to hire the right people that are you know, there to do more than a job, that are really passionate, that they're really craving to do the good, the good stuff out there, unless you're a charity perhaps? So you need culture and margin. And in Patagonia, for example, there is both. And interesting enough, I see it in financial services um, changing a lot, the lever of money and the pressure by governments on asset managers, financial services providers and banks to force them to do better things with the money, to more closely look at how to allocate money. And they are not changing the profit margins because they're still good, they're still healthy, they're state, they're, they have to change culture in order to catch up with this. So long answer to your question. I hope it, it helps. No, it's a good answer. No, I, I like the answer immensely and I think everybody got a lot out of that. Um, can you be a successful brand without purpose? I mean, you really talk about that and, and how do you define purpose as it relates to brand? So let's start with how do you define purpose as it relates to brand? Mm -hmm. Um, I, to put this simply, I would call this um, a radiating spirit or a radiating energy of some sort inside your brand, inside yourself that's aligned. So by that, I mean, it's not just you, but the people who work with you. It's not just you and the people who work with you, but the customer who buy your products, the partners who work with you, the whole ecosystem. I call it shared and aligned purpose. It starts inside, firstly. It's generally, um, uh, I call it a, a radiating energy, some sort of, you know, um, uh, yeah, and let's call it an energy that is generally articulated in very few words, very few, five words or less in my formula. It's not a mission statement. And it needs context. You need to really understand what you mean by it. If you take Apple's um, purpose of humanizing technology, if you don't know Apple and you hear humanizing technology, what the heck is this? But if you understand Apple in its broader context, then it's always about people. It's always about make, making things easy, good, healthy, safe to use, but it's all, mostly, and I think still for a long time, linked to technology. So it starts to make sense. You can go really far with that. And if you ask about my definition of purpose, it's this energy supported by a gravitational force. I call it values. And that transpires through to everything you do and how you do your stuff, where you do it, your objectives, um, uh, your tactics, your operations, your strategy, your distribution, and so forth. But it really starts inside. So this, to me, is purpose. 
some people um, will say, well, purpose is about doing good for the planet. It's about giving back to society. Yes, I mean, we should try and think about contributing to greater societal good. And I always do this in the work with my clients to link purpose, not just to values and doing a good strategy and returning profits, but it's the lifeblood of business, but also to give back to society. So we can link it uh, easily, and it's a very fine line between a vision, for example, and a purpose. But a purpose is more about the energy within supported by a gravitational uh, field of values, so to speak. Can you be a successful brand without purpose? Long-term, I don't think so. I really don't think it's possible. And long term, I think 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I really don't think, you know, you can be successful. You've probably been successful if you've been around for a while. You can be successful this year and next year and beyond. But I do think the idea of attaching meaning uh, to what we do deeply inside, i.e. anchoring in purpose, will become, in, or it does already become increasingly relevant for people to work for you. And no longer to just do what you do because you get paid for it, but asking the question of why I do what I do. And I want to see that in your company. I want to see that in your brand. Uh, there's a, a couple of trends that are associated with this. One is speed. So this doesn't happen over you know, night, but it happens fast. And the other one is transparency. And transparency is primarily driven by data. So it's very easy to see through value chains. And I call it value chains quite, uh, quite deliberately. So the products I buy, Patagonia we mentioned, um, you know, Amazon and ratings is the first expression of, you, of, what, of what you can see. But quite quickly, it can look beyond price and customer service. But in sourcing, whether Starbucks does the right thing or not, I, I take my, my mobile, I flip it on the cup, I flip it on the coffee, and it doesn't just tell me, is this product good? As in price, is it worth it? But also, is it ethically sourced? Can I believe this company? There's a lot happening and this enabling through transparency and speed inside the systems will make the idea of having a purpose of doing the right thing with integrity much more visible. So no, I don't think you can be successful in the long term by not thinking deeply about it, but really in the long term as in the, in the, in the next 10, 20 years. Is that why you think like big brands like Sears and Kmart have disappeared and you know, here in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Inquirer is our major paper, and they've shrunk tremendously. I mean, they only have about a quarter of the people they used to have, and now they've been put into like a, a public uh, trust nonprofit for survival. And, and you would think, of course, that, you know, a newspaper would definitely have purpose. But, you know, what about Sears and Kmart and some of these other big retail brands who were once powerhouses and now no longer exist? Mm -hmm. It's a very good. It's a very good point, Mark. I think it's not um, as simple as having a, a a good purpose will enable, will help, and through culture will also allow you probably to readjust quickly. If you look at why companies fail or big brands and big companies fail, I would say half fail in the past. It's mostly mostly due to competitive pressure. But if you look beyond that or behind that, it's mostly because of culture. I'll give you an example. I think, I mean, most of you guys will be familiar with uh, the Volkswagen diesel gate, yeah. right? So this is fundamentally not, it's about transparency data that was made visible to people to actually unearth uh, the cheat that was going on. But most importantly, it was associated with uh, growth at almost any price. I call it unhealthy growth. It's negative growth at any price. So if you have a culture that is driven by Fear is perhaps a, a, a strong word, but by this, hey, we just need to grow at any price, then that can do tremendous damage because it just blinds you, right? blinds you for opportunities, blinds you from doing the right thing and so forth. And that can be hugely detrimental because you lose trust. And because you lose trust, you lose market value. I mean, billions, tens of billions in the case of Volkswagen. But it can put you out of business. Culture can put you out of business. If you're Kodak or you wear Kodak, culture put you out of business. We really still do photography. We didn't make the shift to, to digital at the time, even though Kodak invented digital photography. They were put out of business, not because of bad people, but because of culture that prevented or inhibited progress, so to speak. And so if you're clever about your value system and about your purpose, you structure it in a way that something like cultural confrontation running against the wall and not even realizing it is at least minimized. 
It won't guarantee that you're in, in business in the next 10 years, but it can be a protection, a hedge in, in, in the worst case, in the best case, an enabler. You, you, and that was a great example, Kodak, because that was a name that the whole planet knew. And yeah. instead of going along with digital, they had all this investment in film and said, let's just keep riding this out. And that was more probably not thinking about the brand than just thinking about from the financial aspect. Yeah, absolutely. And they yeah. killed themselves. Um, mm -hmm. A question from the audience is, what do you think about brands like Facebook and others that started with a social purpose, but now has a darker side to it in terms of Cambridge Analytica and a role in recent US elections? All right. Um, easy yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, it's a very easy question. So let's start with the, the really easy part first. If you look at Cambridge Analytica as an example, and many of you might be entrepreneurs or into, into marketing as well. And if you look at the power that Facebook puts at your fingertip in terms of uh, using data on an individual um, uh, person's level, it's mind blowing and it's scary as well. And I think they have become victim almost of their own success. I don't think they had bad intent. I don't think they, Mark Zuckerberg is an evil person. I don't think they are deliberately um, uh, doing what to do because I think it has grown so fast and so big that it's almost become uncontrollable. So if you were to time travel back 10 years or, or more, you would probably look at this as a really cool startup with a social purpose at heart, with connecting people and all the great things you have. No one would have thought or seen the power that the data, the speed combined with data will make you as an individual transparent and will make you become a product of the bigger machine. And I think just it just it's like an avalanche. I think it just it, the, the guys were probably running and got caught by it itself. No bad intent. No bad intent at all. But today, um, you know, if you ask me what's Facebook's purpose, uh, I, firstly, I would know it by heart. Uh, probably good idea to Google it quickly, check it out. And secondly, I would probably not believe it. I would probably not believe it that it's really genuine. And this is tricky because this trust that they've built by being a social enterprise, they've deviated from that path by commercializing they're very people, well, as in you know, the individual's profiles and the data associated with it as part of their growth. Very tricky. I don't think they've seen it coming and I think it's very hard to pick it up. Yeah, well, I think uh, in the beginning, he stayed away from it. And when venture capital people put money on the West Coast, they said eventually yep. he's got to start bringing in advertising revenue because he'll run out of our money. And so he did, and then he thought he could control it. And then it's kind of spun out of control. Like you say, it's got its own life now. It's like mm -hmm. a living organism. Yeah. Um, how, how local and small businesses can benefit from a new way of brand? How can local and small businesses benefit uh, from a new way of branding? And what are the practical advice and small it takes? Yeah. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. It's a very good question because I do think it sounds all abstract, but it's actually very powerful. For the first thing that a small business can, um, um, well, let, let me make a quick, a quick uh, parenthesis. What you do have is a proliferation of channels, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, that's just social and much more. They all cost money and they're all complex to handle for an individual. So it's, it's, you face complexity and you face cost. So how can you as a small business use brand to really drive success? Well, firstly, it's about positioning. I think it's about being crystal clear for whom you are and for whom you are not. And that's really hard. It's really about making choices for whom you are not. And it's very difficult for small and local entrepreneurs generally to be really clear, almost polarizing, to be super sharp for something, right? So if I'm, let's say, if I have a, um, I don't know, if I have a, a dog, if I have a, um, I don't know, a dog grooming saloon, right, in my local town, then uh, if you are a service provider, you might not just be the person or the business that provides that dog grooming saloon with shampoos and products and what have you, but you might be the one that is providing the best product for a particular breed. It's really niching down. It's really about niching down. It doesn't mean you don't sell other products, but you will be known for the best product for that particular breed. And you can scale that to something like this. You can almost automate it. You can build um, scalable propositions around it, but it really starts. And I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes amazed how much 
time and money small entrepreneurs and businesses spend on channels, on tactics, on advertisement, without thinking about the fundamental stuff that builds strong brands, clarity of positioning, and as a declination of it, clarity of messages, really relevant to the audience they serve for a particular niche. If you can crack that, it's much easier to use this huge complexity that is at our fingertips and always sounds so easy to, to activate. But I would encourage everybody to start there. I would say if my mom's Mahjong group doesn't understand it, then I'm not uh, communicating it well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because, you know, usually if, if the person, if people can't explain what you do who don't live it every day, because that's what you find with a lot of technology companies, they make their proposition so convoluted that nobody really knows what they're doing. I see that all the time in websites when you read their information, unless you're really very technical, you don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's a recipe for disaster. If you're, you know, start to be everything for everybody, it's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good way to go out of business. Uh, how would you help individuals define their own personal brand if they've never actively thought about it or other practices to identify their own core values and how they can mm -hmm. communicate them to their internal and external audiences. All right, um, how would I, well, you can read the book. There is a chapter on it. It's for companies, of course, um, really intended for businesses, but it works on an individual level as well. Um, secondly, um, how would I help someone doing that? Um, I use the same frameworks, first of all. I've done it in the past on an individual basis for management, comp management gurus, uh, leadership professor, I've stopped uh, doing that. Uh, because it's just not as uh, viable, I would say, unfortunately, even though there's uh, money at stake for this. But I do, I do think you can do it. You can do it by relatively um, s simple tasks, right? I, I mean, without going into a class here, but ask yourself where your passions are, ask yourself where your values are, and but start with that. Start with what do I, what can I do really well? What do other people really see I am doing well? What am I known for of doing, of really doing well? Am I passionate about it? Is this really something that drives? How do I do it? What do I do? All the stuff you can articulate it. Only once you've done that, ask yourself, okay, what values will drive this behavior and support these passions, for example? You think about values and only then do you take a step back and ask, okay, so why do I really what I do and what is the motivating driver or the energy that drives this? In a nutshell, I call it the guiding purpose strategy framework. It works for companies, it works for individuals. If you're really interested, I do have a class where we unpack this um, uh, quite a bit on the Brand Marketing Booster uh, website. It's quite a long class. It's about five hours of, of, of class and it's, it's intense, um, but you can do it in a couple of days if you want to go and check that out. Be my guest and we go through the frameworks in much more uh, detail in there. How, how have you done this for yourself? You know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're eating your own dog food. So how have you done this for yourself? Well, it's not a short process. Uh, the framework is easy. It's pretty straightforward. And I'm confident you will understand it uh, quite quickly. What the hard part is your own time and the reflection on it. And you shouldn't do it in isolation. You probably need a few peers. In all the brand workshops I do, and in also um, for individual levels, the same thing, you need peers, um, either you know friends, relatives, if you have clients or customers, that's great. If you have prospects, even better. And if you can ask lost customers, even better to validate what you're developing. So you can't do it in, uh, in, in, in isolation. How did I do this for myself? Yes. Well, the framework that I developed is partly because I've gone through this process myself. So for example, right, if, if you ask me, so, okay, so what's your purpose? And my own purpose is relatively simple. I, I, I help people grow and I enjoy that hugely. So I help you grow and it's very simple. I apply this and I think, hey, I've got three kids. I'm really passionate about helping them to thrive in life, what I can contribute as a dad. But the same applies when I work with clients. This is my driving energy is to help them advance, is to help them grow. But it didn't jump at me, right? So something like this uh, might sound relatively universal, relatively simple, but in my context, it's perfectly well, or it fills me perfectly well, at least in my um, stage of life, at least or it has for the last five years. And I think it will stick around for the next 10 or so, very hopefully. But how do you get there? 
I took him, um, uh, I remember 10 years ago, I, I was so wound up in this to develop the framework and define this for myself. I took a cruise of five days for myself. And I went on this cruise and wrote, st wrote stuff down every day. I mean, it was great fun. It was really good, but it was a lot of deep reflection. I don't think you can do this the easy way. The framework's not the complicated part. It's your own thinking and it's your own, uh, well, reflection and also your own mirroring of your own thoughts towards others to hone it. And you continuously hone it. It took me two or three years to really get to clarity of values for myself and clarity of purpose for myself. And today I don't need to think about it, but I do look at it almost every day just to remind myself what those are. They're abstract, right? Even for me, but it helps to have that somewhere um, close to you to remind yourself of why you do what you do. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but by all means. No, no, and I think one of the helpful things that you said was, you know, you going on that cruise. I mean, it could be going away for a week somewhere, but you need that change of scenery to help yep. you think through this. I myself, not only like the change of scenery, but I read a ton of publications that spur new ideas with me. And then I start putting them all down in a Word document. Mm -hmm. and, and that helps me think through my own strategy. I mm -hmm. like writing everything down. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely helpful to take a step back of the everyday race to do an exercise like this. And uh, it's transformational. It's, it's, if you, I mean, I don't think you can do this in a couple of hours, but I think you can do it in a couple of days to really give it a good, a really a good go at it. And then it starts, then the digest, I call this the digestive process in our, in our client work a lot, right? And sometimes companies are surprised at the simplicity of it and that it doesn't take more consulting time on my end um, or on our end it's perfectly fine. What takes time is the reflection of people. And if you have a board or executives, it's not just an individual, but you have to align that sense of purpose, that sense of being times five, times 10. And that takes time. That takes cajoling, nurturing, reflection, digestion. digestion. So we stimulate it, gives a real push, give them reflection time, and then over an iteration, start to iterate coming back until it's aligned and it really suits a company or a culture. But it's a process. It's a, for an individual, I would say it's a, it's a good couple of days of self-reflection and it's a good couple of months at least to keep honing that, to keep challenging it and to keep it on your agenda to think consciously about it. I, I once uh, ran a startup that the chairman uh, tell me, didn't tell me, he ordered it. He said, I want you to take off every Friday, no phone, no computer, nothing. And I just want you to spend that day thinking, nothing mm -hmm. else, just thinking. Mm -hmm. And it was, he had built a business from zero uh, to a uh, billion dollars and sold it for $4.2 billion. And he said, you know, we all too often spend so much time working on time that we don't spend a lot of time thinking and, and we can't be as successful if we don't take some time and shut the rest of the world out and just mm -hmm. do some thinking. One of the questions that I uh, have here is uh, one of the folks said they would like to know what's your, you know, the clients you've worked with, um, uh, leadership challenge or reject the new branding that this process has created. Can you tell some of the uh, success stories you've had using your process with some of your clients? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sure. I mean, it's a, I, I must touch wood. I work with very few clients and I honestly only work if there's a fit. And if we can feel this fit, great, let's do it. Let's go for it. Uh, but if we can't, uh, then, uh, then I steer clear of it. And I think it's a very good question that's raised here. Generally, when something as transformational as a culture change or a real deep reflection on purpose comes up, it's a very bad sign to me if it comes from the marketing folks. Uh, having been a marketeer myself, I know what I'm talking about here, but then it's generally something that is seen as a bit of a, a nice idea. We should have a purpose. Uh, we know, we should, we're a brand, we need a brand purpose. Um, I'm not sure, right? For communica pure communications and activities, marketeers generally are involved, whether you really need a purpose. It's most successful when it comes either from C-level executives or even better from the board. If the board mandates the CEO to say, you know, that stuff, that reorganization, that, that acquisition, that new market really needs a culture shift, think about how you're going to do it. If it starts at that level, then generally it's successful. 
generally. And what does success mean? Success means if you work with a client on a purpose that they're really excited. Remember this spiritual core, this energy, this articulation of it. If you manage to get a company on that part, you can really ignite movement. You can ignite action. You can ignite alignment around it. Mm. And guess what? It's not always for everybody, but so far, the experiences I have made is the, the best testimony for me is if the client calls me back and says, hey, we've got a great workshop to run. Hey, we've got the leadership development team. Can you come and run it? So continuously being pulled in. And then, of course, uh, the, 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 sometimes it's, it's really you really feel sometimes it takes a year or two. You become part of the extended team. And it's really nice that they start to take you inside almost belonging to something you've helped shape or create. For me, this is success. This is an, 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 a, a nice way to feel that you help someone grow, that they move forward. Has it ever been rejected? Yes, things have already been rejected. Uh, things have been rejected, but generally it's um, that this is really when, when, when stuff comes left field from working, and I don't do it anymore for that reason, can we do, can we work on a brand purpose with a marketing team? And then the marketing team goes to the CEO and say, hey, we look, we need a purpose. Um, we've developed one. What do you think? <laughs> it's the wrong way around. Yeah, it right. Generally, of course. Generally, it generally is the same thing as if you come into a branding project and it's failed because they started with the logo, right? And then the whole thing falls apart. No one's thought about the depth underneath, about the value systems, about competitive differentiation. And you're pulled in helping to fix stuff that was set up the wrong way uh, from, from the beginning. So I think through trial and error, I've managed by now to detect or smell or feel where, where things come from and by asking um, up front. Uh, what, are the, what are there, let's say, three key essentials for brands navigating through this whole volatile time and continue being sustainable post-COVID? Oh, wow. Three, uh, well, f first, I, I come back to this. I think this is really key. And I think it changes um, uh, for a lot of companies, as we say, is clarity of who you are. This clarity of who you are, not just why you, why you do what you do, but clarity as who you are in relation to your competition and in relation to your clients or your target audience. This is absolutely key. If the environment changes and you don't adjust, you, you might you know, be very efficient in what you do, but you might run against the wall. And this is exactly the reason why Kodak, for example, got lost. And it's exactly the reason why IBM actually pivoted multiple times by having this flexibility, by continuously re-questioning whether um, there is a fit by who you are, how you position with the audience, your clients, or your future clients, and relevancy as a consequence or not. This is the first one. Uh, the second one is probably confidence. A uh, confidence in once you've taken that decision and consistency. And the third one would be frequency, if you think about it from a brand point of view. But it's the clarity of positioning communicated regularly with a lot of confidence and confidence, consistency and frequency will build, they will build success over time. But you can be consistent and frequent in what you do, but if you're heading the wrong way, no good. Yeah, uh, without question about that. Um, you talk about in the book, uh, and you say, you have to ask the question whether growth is good. When is it bad? I mean, for investors, they always think, hey, no matter what, growth is always good. But when's it yeah. bad? When's it bad? Um, it's bad when, growth is bad when it induces stress. And inducing stress is not just, I don't just mean this of, you know, long days and blah, 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 and, you know, on an individual level, stress can also be uh, financial stress, margin under pressure, products under pressure, delays and so forth, and pushing your machine, so to speak, right, or your company or your brand so hard that you start to induce stress. It's unhealthy. And again, I think Volkswagen and Dieselgate is a perfect example. Growth at any price is not healthy. Growth at any price can also be negative. And you've seen the, down, we've seen the downfall of this. It's a prime example of go growth gone wrong. Um, why do we cheat on emissions? Well, because we can sell more cars. Why do we want to sell more cars? Well, we want to become number one. And if you don't help me do this, you're not part of that company. 
really difficult, really ingrained in the culture, a culture of fear almost, uh, to drive that growth negative, not good, not healthy. And I think we see less of it, but we do see from time to time um, such examples where growth is just um, negative. Wells Fargo did that. You know, they pressured people on the front line to sign up as many accounts as possible. So they start making up accounts. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I heard people say, uh, I'm not going to be doing banking with Wells Fargo. I don't trust them. How do I know that the teller isn't going to take my name and create an account just so she makes a bonus mm -hmm. uh, from it? So it's very mm -hmm. interesting That's how, how that could ruin your brand. Um, Absolutely. You, you quote a study that 70% of transformational acquisitions don't meet expectations. Why is that? <laughs> okay, the short answer is culture. So if you think about an acquisition, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, with my work, get normally pulled in when an acquisition is a done deal. And then the CEO or the chairman stands uh, you know, in front of a building, looks at the doorbell and thinks, well, how are we going to call this? Because they have a different logo, right? But the acquisition's done. They've bought a company, they've bought 100 people in private equity, and they're an asset management shop, and they now have two companies to put together. So all the rationale to do this, all all the figures, all the efficiencies, all the scale effects have all been calculated. And it's a perfect economic sense to acquire these 100 people and have a private equity shop as part of your extended asset management offering. Fantastic. But they are completely different cultures. And that only manifests once you bring the people together. So if this is not actively managed, and unfortunately, it's either not actively managed, it's an afterthought, or it happens with pure, pure, relatively pure execution, it's a clash. And if we think that ultimately, it's the people that make it happen. If you lose the people that should make it happen, transformations fail. Two thirds fail, not because it was not a clever move, but because the cultures were just not compatible or couldn't be merged in a, in a, in a, in a good way to start with. So one of the questions we have here is, what is the best authentic branding message you have ever heard and why did you like it so much? <laughs> the best authentic brand message, Harley Davidson, screw it, let's write. Um, I think because I mean, and I heard this in, uh, you know, when was this? This was the financial crisis 2008. Lehman Brothers collapsed, right? Everything went down. HDFS, Harley Davidson Financial Services went bust because they gave, you know, they gave a lot of, they had a lot of bad credit, essentially loaning or you know, loans, giving out loans to people who couldn't afford the bike in the first place. It just went down. And I remember uh, the CMO at the time came up with this and say, well, let's screw it, you know, screw it, let's ride. This is about, we're about freedom, we're about breaking out, we're about enjoying what we can, open roads and so forth. And I really thought it was genuine. If you looked at the rider base, if you looked at people who enjoy what they do with the product, it was really genuine. It was such a miserable time for everybody. Uh, you know, taxes went up, uh, God, God knows what. I mean, COVID's bad too, but this financially, this, 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 this was a harsh time or hard time for a lot of people too. Unemployment went up and so forth. But hopping in a Harley and just go out there and forget about it, I thought it was brilliant. It was really, really honestly um, intended. And it said exactly what the feeling was at the time. Just screw it, let's write. I, you know what, I could hear somebody around the table saying that, <laughs> and that's just a brilliant uh, line for sure. Has inexpensiveness of social media and the use of video made it uh, for it made it easier for insurgent brands to topple leaders? I mean, no longer do you really have to buy expensive television ads uh, to succeed. Uh, you mean topple leaders as in, in brands or as in the individuals? Or I mean, as in brands, as in companies. As in brands. Yeah, I actually, you know, I, I think this is a bit of a false economy. I don't think so. I think within bubbles, you probably see success of brands that have used social media to great effect. But you also see a lot of reluctancy. You see, for example, Procter & Gamble saying, hey, you know what? We're going to stop all our digital spend for a, for a little while and see what difference it makes because they challenge the efficiency of it. So if we hold that thought, right, it's powerful. But for this to be powerful, we think, for it to be powerful, there's no my, there's proof still out there to, to be delivered. Um, that you need a couple of things. You need, firstly, a good understanding on how these networks work. You need talented people that can actually handle the complexity. And you need budget. There's no such thing as building a strong brand 
by organically just being on social media. I mean, that's the beauty on one side, right, of these big machines, that if you really want to reach something, you have to have, and that's the next point, deep pockets, media pockets. It's a shift from traditional advertisement into these big machines. So unless you can serve that, and generally it's bigger corporates that are able to do this professionally enough, understand it, have the deep pockets, have the media, can produce the quality of content with the frequency and consistency strong brands, good brand building will need, it's actually not that easy. It sounds so easy. Let's just go on Facebook Business Manager, target my audience. Yes, it's pretty good. You can do sharp stuff with it, but it's not um, uh, the key to building a strong brand on the back of that only. Uh, how can buyers identify inauthentic brands? How can buyers? Okay. Um, luckily, I think by um, firstly, just looking at reviews, transparency. Uh, we saw it in the travel industry first with trip advisors. We see it on Amazon. We see it with ratings. I think there is um, a, a way of seeing through some of it, but it's hard to differentiate. It's really hard to spot it. I'll give you an example here with uh, Hermes. Hermes, um, super expensive luxury brand producing handbags made out of real crocodile leather, right? Um, for $50,000, $100,000 and up. And if you want one for your wife's birthday this year, you can't get one anyway, because these things are really scarce. Very desirable brand, very, very luxurious brand. Do they do the right thing? So this happened, and you can check this out a couple of years ago, that someone in Austin, actually, in Austin, Texas, went onto one of these crocodile farms, took a, took a mobile, took a video of how these poor crocodiles are treated just to create leather for the real Hermes Birkin bag made out of real crocodile leather. Put it on social media and within no time you have a huge shitstorm going on. I mean, this is, this, is, uh, this is, and so quick that the brand itself couldn't even react. The name Jane Birkin, it's a famous actress, uh, she lives, she exists, right? She was quicker. She put on Twitter, at Hermes, take the name off my back until you fix your problems. So you can just see how quick, how fast this entire, um, uh, entire thing actually moves. And I think this puts brands under increasing pressure to do the right thing to start with. So you don't have to soup out or uh, spoon out the soup uh, that, uh, that uh, you actually don't want to. But how can you identify it? Um, it's really hard. I think it's really, really hard. How would you have known buying a Volkswagen if they told you, look, you know, this is a good diesel car, the emissions are really super efficient, then you buy this on their promise, and then later on discover that it was a cheat. I mean, how do you want to see through that? I think it's really, really hard. I don't think actually this is easy. Talk to people, talk to peers, Google it, look at reviews, go visit the company if you can and be bold enough to raise your voice if you spot something that isn't right. I have to say that because of the internet, you know, when you're checking out whether to work somewhere or buy a product, yeah. there's so much information by buyers on there that it's, you have to up your game and you have to be uh, honest and authentic because people call you out on it. You can't mm -hmm. hide it anymore. Exactly. That's the beauty of it. How, how is and will artificial intelligence impact brands? Wow, that's another a bit. Well, firstly, there is um, uh, an answer on this on efficiency. So artificial intelligence at this stage is really about machine learning, it's algorithms. Algorithms are great at spotting patterns. And based on patterns, you can build what is called predictive marketing, so to speak, for example, right? So I can predict where you are in your buyer cycle and therefore I can more efficiently structure a customer journey, serve you the right ad at the right time because I no longer uh, just observe, but I can actually predict based on machine learning and artificial in intelligence. So it has a lot of implications within brand management and marketing. It's really an efficiency tool, first and foremost, but on the brand level itself, on a less tactical level, perhaps, it's also quite, I think it will be hugely transformational because these algorithms, um, AI, for example, they will start increasingly taking, they will start take decisions on my behalf because they know me quite well. And you know, they know what kind of toilet paper I, I want, what kind of Kleenex type I want, what kind of everyday product I want. 
why should I go to Walmart or Sam's or wherever in the US and buy that if the algorithm can do it for me? So there's no, there's no emotion in there anymore. It will just negotiate on my behalf. It will negotiate the best price and it will shop it for me for the best available deal. If you're a brand, how do you differentiate? How do you stand out? I mean, the whole idea of building a brand and emotion is going to be really hard or much harder because decisions are increasingly being taken by algorithms and less by people. Um, and that sounds perhaps a bit manipulative and we as human beings are very manipulative. I mean, we are and can be easily manipulated by orchestrating clever messaging, for example. And if the algorithm it takes that out of the equation, then that will become a challenge for a lot of brands, I think. I certainly think with AI, I have an Alexa and uh, yeah. it's clearly- The device is offline oh. to connect. So <laughs> there she goes. <laughs> yeah, she's then sucking up sense. everything I say. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I mentioned to my girlfriend, I need a new backpack. And all of a sudden yeah. a bunch of ads start showing up. Uh, for businesses with small marketing budgets, what type of marketing is the best and brings the best ROI? Okay, sorry to say, but it really depends. I think firstly, if you are if you're in B two B, for example, it will be different than if you're B two C. That's the first fundamental um, uh, differentiator. But if you are, let's say, a small business and uh, it, you know you you look for your audience, then I think the best ROI. Um, and I must say that's partly the reason why Google and Facebook are so big, LinkedIn increasingly so as well. It really is super slick. If you create a targeted, and again, start with the message, start with positioning, but if that creates relevancy and cut through with your target audience, to put that into a, I call it a fishing hook, let's say, in the digital world and use Facebook Business Manager, for example. It's not super complicated or you hire someone on Upwork or Fiverr to do it for you and set that up consistently with the right message and frequency and a little bit of budget. It's pretty good. It's, it, can, it can really do quite well, but that's very generic, right? If you are a local carpenter, that might look slightly different. Yeah, I, 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 what I always suggest to clients is we got to interview your clients and prospects and ask them what's the best way to market to them. And if they were in charge of marketing you, how would they go about doing it? Because even for this show, uh, and we have people from 32 countries that listen in, um, mm -hmm. we basically found that social media doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. And e email emails work and newsletters work mm -hmm. and some... and. Uh, putting it on bulletin boards of mm -hmm. different organizations mm -hmm. that works and we also mm -hmm. know the average age of our audience is 51 and mm -hmm. so they're the readers of these business books so mm -hmm. we kind of know that and i've had a lot of young writers on mm -hmm. and they told me that social media doesn't really work uh for them for mm -hmm. marketing their books you know they're between yeah. like oh, age yeah. 30 and 35 and my daughter uh handled the social media for like three months and she's the dad's just a waste of time and money um, mm -hmm. to do this. Yeah, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's very, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I have a small client, relatively small client, and he wanted to do stuff on LinkedIn and I told him, don't go there. It's, you know, it, it's just too expensive for what you will get out. And the good thing with these tools is that you can measure pretty much audience sizes and you can calculate costs in advance. So it's pretty measurable and you can also determine when it's not right or when you don't do it. But I fully agree with you, Mark. I mean, it really is the marketing mix is not just social media. And if I do, I'm part of on the board of a charity as well and travel every year to countries when I can travel far away, for example, to Kyrgyzstan or Georgia or Nicaragua or you name it, Rwanda, for example, for entrepreneurs. And um, every year I teach one class as well as a, as a time um, donation, so to speak. And it's sometimes amazing, right? The, what works in one country is will not work. The social yeah. media, we don't go with Facebook to Russia. No good if you're in China, when forget about Google or yeah. YouTube. And it, it, so it's really, you really have to tailor this. I think start with your audience, as you say as well. For me, positioning is very much about audience and it's very much about relevancy and it's very much about messaging and then take a step back and say, what's the right channel to get that there? And how much money do I need to take in my hands to actually get on that channel? And that might not be digital. That's right. In the book, you write about today's CEO's mission. What is it and will that change over the next decade? 
Um, the, no, the, uh, no and yes, I think it will be adjusted, but the CEO's mission, he's mandated by the board generally to generate the return. And I think that's rightly so. The lifeblood of a business is profit. And if we don't have four wheels on a car, we don't need to think about going from A to B, right? So it's really, really simple in many ways. But what does happen increasingly as the mandate is expanded is to demonstrate doing good beyond just a beautiful corporate social responsibility brochure. That we do see, and that for CEOs is increasingly a task mandated by boards or governments or authorities to demonstrate that as well. I see it as a fundamentally really good thing. So it won't completely change what the CEO does in the future, but that is additional. And I think that's a very good, a very good tendency that we observe. Um, can you please explain the concepts of on the record and off the record and how do companies utilize this to build their brand and connect with customers? Yes, sure. Uh, the first one is relatively easy. Um, on the record, off the record. So if you imagine, I don't know, uh, you say the average age is 51. So most of you people might remember that we used to have cameras that were not digital a while back. So you could easily be off the record somewhere on a beautiful island and then very quickly go on the record by having a video camcorder, for example, but you were not able to stream it or distribute it. So you were not on the record. You might have recorded a piece or an experience of your life that you particularly enjoyed to take it back with you to your loved ones or friends and family and shown it later on. The difference is that today, this happens instantaneously. If you're 18 or less, then you're probably on TikTok already. And it's just incredible. Remember speed, I think is one of the key themes and key trends that actually converges to two, that on the record and off the record, uh, are no, we're no longer able to separate it. I, I work a lot with the reputation or media and that doesn't exist on the record, off the record, it's everything's on the record. Almost everything you do, everywhere you are, you're either tracked, you're seen, and even if you don't think so, you probably are. And therefore what you do and how you behave and where you are is being put on the record. Now, how can brands use this and how do they use it? I mean, look at, look at Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, for example, and WhatsApp all becomes one. And so you have a, a few people who say, well, I'm no longer going to use WhatsApp because they collect everything. They do collect everything and very shortly will be able in Facebook Business Manager or similar to use that data to infinitely target you even at a much more granular level. And who will make a lot more money out of this? Facebook, of course. So, you know, I think this being on the record is a, is a, is, is a fact. We are on the record and brands will and do use the data it provides primarily to sell you more stuff. Yeah, it's funny, my son-in-law now has me using something called Signal Instead yeah, me of too. Since yesterday, I just discovered this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. he just put yeah. me on it. Yeah, he just told me I want you to get on that. So when we communicate, <clears throat> these guys aren't collecting every single piece of information from us. They are. Uh, so I guess this is maybe my last question, and, and maybe we can squeeze one more in. But you write, never aspire to what already exists. Is that for specific industries or a blanket statement? Because sometimes mimicking a successful venture makes sense because the leader is educated and proven the market. What's your message here? Huh, I have to be careful here. If you're a young entrepreneur and you're building your career, uh, you might be very well off to aspire to someone or something that holds um, you know, a lot of value for you. So I wouldn't, I think, you know, if you have a mentor, for example, you aspire to, uh, to that. I think that's actually a good thing because it provides an anchor and you pick an anchor that has a good value set or a good reason for being there is nothing wrong with it. But if you want to inspire or if you want to inspire yourself, and perhaps this ha happens only later in your life or your career, I would really think what, I, what you know, being aspirational has to do with who you are and who you want to be, and you should look beyond. You should, be, you should look beyond someone else or something else so that you can build and create something you leave behind. You can say, hey, it's me. It's authentically me. I haven't copied it. I haven't cloned it. I have had mentors in lives, but it's ultimately myself. And I guess it's this what I, um, uh, what I wanted to transport with that. Well, I, I think I can fit this one qu uh, question in if you can answer it quickly. How important is diversity in the workplace to developing and implementing a successful purpose strategy? Oh, okay. Look, it's both. 
I, the, the, per, personally, I think um, uh, actually we're all human beings, right? We're all important. We all matter. We all count. And the purpose should be universal. It should encompass everything. Now, whether you use a purpose to address diversity, I'd be very careful. I strongly be, believe in a universal set of energy, so to speak, that should radiate. And I strongly believe it's about identifying this at a level of a corporation as well. And therefore, it really should be about humanistic values. And it shouldn't be about race, gender, age, you name it, right? It, it shouldn't actually interfere at that stage. I think it's a very important topic. Don't get me wrong. I strongly believe in it, but I would be careful to use diversity to start embedding it into the purpose of an organization, of a corporate, of a business corporate. Now, if you're an NGO that fights for uh, female rights or women rights around the world, it's a different thing. It's core of your purpose, for sure. But as a general statement to put diversity into a purpose reflection for a corporate, I'd be, I'd be somewhat cautious with that. Marcus Kramer <laughs> from Mark Kramer. Thank you, Mark Kramer. It's a pleasure. Uh I thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. I look forward to your Pleasure. next book. I really enjoyed this. I hope people will buy your book Thanks. now that they've heard from you. And I hope all of you have a great rest of your weekend. Hope to see you all next Friday uh, when our next author is interviewed. So everybody have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Take care.